Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. In today's episode, there are very brief descriptions of child sex trafficking and self-harm. Listener discretion is advised. The teenaged killer is a polarizing issue in our society. We often see it in black and white terms. They are born bad, or they are a product of their upbringing. And science tells us that our brains are not fully formed until about the age of 25. We might understand that academically, but when a teenager commits a heinous murder, we are blinded by the brutality. It's rarely a question of whether or not they are tried as adults. They usually are. The horrific acts of violence suddenly and irrevocably makes them adults. Today's case is about a brutal double murder. It's the kind of overkill we associate with rage, with psychopaths, with adults. Holly Harvey was 15 and Sandy Ketchum was 16, and they were in love. Both had dismal upbringings, especially Holly, who would be considered the ringleader in this vicious crime, though it's impossible to know that for sure, as the girls did give varying stories. But Holly turned on the only people to have given her a stable home in her young life, her grandparents. And while they gave her her own space in their home, privacy most teens only dream of, they still expected her to follow the rules. And their rules were fair, typical even, except one. The conservative Baptist couple would not condone Holly's relationship with Sandy. Holly's little basement apartment became a cage. If there's anything we understand for sure about teenagers, it's that first loves are all-consuming. The rush of hormones, combined with lifetime traumas, became a pressure cooker for Holly and Sandy, no matter whose story you believe. Welcome to episode 153, Teenage Killers, Holly Harvey and Sandy Ketchum. Located around 15 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia, sits the small town of Fayetteville. At the time this episode takes place, the majority of the town's 14,000 residents were devout Christians. Two pillars of the Fayetteville Conservative Baptist community were Carl and Sarah Collier. Born in 1928, Carl grew up in Cartersville, a small town just north of Atlanta. While attending high school, Carl fell in love with Sarah Jenkins, who was two years younger. The couple married in 1949, and the next year, Carl began serving in the Army. Two years later, Carl was discharged from the military, and he eventually started working as a mechanic and supervisor for Delta Airlines, while Sarah found a career as a bank teller. Unable to have their own children, the Colliers chose to adopt. They adopted their son Kevin in 1965, and then their daughter Carla in 1967. The new family moved into a white brick ranch-style home located in the 200 block of Plantation Drive in Fayetteville. Carl, Sarah, and their two children became members of the First Baptist Church of Fayetteville. One of their pastors later described the couple as being salt of the earth people who lived consistent, steady lives. They were hardworking, wise people. They were very involved in the church, not leadership positions, but quiet areas of ministry. Throughout their childhoods, Kevin and Carla attended church with their parents. Kevin never seemed to mind, but as she grew older, Carla started to rebel. By the time she was in high school, Carla didn't want to go to church. She wanted to hang out with her friends instead. The problem was that Carl and Sarah didn't like their daughter's friends, who had introduced a young and impressionable Carla to drugs and alcohol. Kevin Collier later told Kevin F. McMurray, the author of If You Really Loved Me, that on numerous occasions, he witnessed his parents get in knockdown drag out fights with Carla, who refused to listen and continued hanging out with those friends her parents so disapproved of. What happens next? and over the course of the next 20 years, is not completely clear. Details vary by source, but we've done our best to reconstruct a reliable timeline. When Carla was 17 years old, she dropped out of high school and left town with her boyfriend, an older guy named Gene Harvey. Gene had previously been convicted of several DUIs, 
burglary and escaping from jail, and he was actually on the run from police. So Carla gave him Kevin's social security number, which he then used to obtain a driver's license under Kevin's name. The stolen identity would help elude the police for the next four years while the couple moved around the country, going as far as California. Carla later told the magazine Maxim, we must have lived in 16 states in those years. While on the run, Carla learned that Jean was an alcoholic who was violent and jealous. Once they were staying at a Texas motel and Jean saw Carla talking to another man. She had been lying by the pool trying to get some sun. Jean didn't want his woman talking to anyone else, so he dragged her into their room. Once inside, Carla told Maxim, quote, He beat my ass so bad he broke my nose and both my eyes were swollen shut. Years later, Carla came to realize she stayed with Jean, not just because she loved him, but, quote, I was desperate for someone to love me and for a family of my own to love. In mid-1988, police finally caught up to Jean and arrested him. The next day, Carla found out she was pregnant. She had nowhere else to go, so she moved back in with her parents in Fayetteville, Georgia. On March 23, 1989, Carla gave birth to Holly Ann Harvey, and they continued living with Carla's parents, Carl and Sarah. Things were okay until Jean was released from jail. Carla decided to move in with him, taking Holly with her. It wasn't long before Carla was back at the Collier's doorstep, looking for a place to stay. Her relationship with Jean had come to an end under tragic circumstances. The Harvey family had been in a horrific car accident, which left Jean a quadriplegic and Holly with a possible brain injury. The brain injury was later suggested by Holly's court-appointed attorney. Carla and Jean's relationship could not withstand all the trauma, so Carla and Holly left and moved in with the Colliers, and Jean went to live with a family member. Sarah and Carl were happy to have their granddaughter staying with them. According to a close friend of Sarah's, Holly's relationship with her grandparents was wonderful at this time. She even had a bedroom across the hall from Carl and Sarah. However, the Colliers were not happy to have their daughter back living with them. As much as they enjoyed having their granddaughter in their home, they were retired at this point and they didn't want to raise another child. They just wanted to relax. But Carla was always out partying, leaving the responsibility of raising Holly to her parents. The Colliers finally grew tired of their daughter's irresponsible behavior and kicked her and Holly out. In 1993, Carla and four-year-old Holly moved in with Carla's brother, Kevin. The situation was fine, except Kevin couldn't stand how Carla parented Holly. He told author Kevin F. McMurray that Holly had no structure or discipline. She could basically do whatever she wanted with no consequence. Carla explained to Maxim, quote, I wanted to be the kind of mother I wish I'd had. Maybe that was a mistake. Then Carla started dating a man named Scott Moore. And soon she and Holly moved in with Scott. They would continue living with him off and on for years. Carla started working part-time as a waitress at a strip club called the Crazy Horse Saloon, not far from the Atlanta airport. She told Maxim, girls dancing there were earning $400 on a bad night. As you can imagine, after watching women make that kind of money, it wasn't long before Carla started dancing. When she was working, Holly stayed with her grandparents, a situation everyone was happy about. But soon, Carla started going down a very dark path. According to Killer Instinct with Chris Hansen, Carla started sex trafficking Holly when she was 12 years old. She would set Holly up to have sex with men in exchange for cash or drugs. Few sources bring up these trafficking allegations. However, Killer Instinct did work with law enforcement to produce this episode. Around this same time, Holly started to rebel against the traumatic life she was forced to live. When Carla was working nights, Holly would sneak out of the house, meet up with friends, smoke weed, drink, and basically began spiraling down. Carla's boyfriend Scott said he had to go up and down the street to chase her down. 
He told the Atlanta Constitution, quote, I'd follow her and I'd find the little aluminum wrappers she used for her marijuana. When Scott confronted her, Holly would tell him, There's nothing you can do about it. You're not my father. By 2001, Carla had racked up three DWIs, two with Holly in the car. She was sentenced to five months in jail, and Holly moved in with her uncle Kevin. For those five months, Holly and Kevin got along great. Kevin even set up some rules and structure, things every kid needs. Kevin said they were thriving, until Carla was released. Once she was back in Holly's life, everything fell apart. One night, Kevin came home and found Holly crying. He confronted Carla, which escalated into a fight, and the police were called. After this last incident, Kevin kicked Carla and Holly out. Just like his parents, he'd had enough of his sister's behavior, and Holly was collateral damage. In 2002, Carla was sent to prison. The actual charge isn't clear, but she already had quite the rap sheet, so it could have been anything. And 13-year-old Holly went to stay with a friend in a nearby town. That kid was bounced around so much, and now she was entering puberty, wrought with new hormones. She then enrolled in Flat Rock Middle School, where she met the young woman who would help her commit a brutal double murder. On April 19, 1988, Sandra Sandy Ketchum was also born into a dysfunctional family. Her father, Tim, was a truck driver, gone for long periods at a time, and her mother, Sandra, who she was named after, was neglectful. She paid little to no attention to her newborn baby, leaving Sandy in dirty diapers and rarely feeding her. The only thing Sandra cared about was partying and sleeping. When Sandy was 15 months old, Tim filed for divorce and full custody. Sandra did not contest either. So Sandy Ketchum grew up very close to her father and considered him to be her friend. She told him everything. But Tim wasn't a perfect father. He also partied a lot, often leaving Sandy with her grandma. Between kindergarten and eighth grade, Sandy attended 10 different schools, and she moved just as many, if not more, times. She already had a lot in common with Holly Harvey. Tim also brought a series of women into Sandy's life. She loved her first stepmother, but sadly, the woman suffered numerous brain aneurysms. Her stepmom survived surgery, but was left with severe brain damage. It was extremely difficult for Sandy and Tim to move on, but everyone decided it was for the best. Sandy absolutely despised Tim's next wife because she beat her stepdaughter. Sandy tried telling her dad and even showed him pictures of her bruises, but Tim didn't believe her until he caught his wife in the act. And even then, Tim did not kick his wife out. After Sandy ran away from home, Tim finally realized the severity of the situation and left his wife. He later told Killer Instinct that he couldn't believe he had not left sooner. Sandy considered her third stepmother, Beth, to be her real mother. She absolutely loved her, and Beth loved Sandy back. Finally, Tim and Sandy Ketchum were happy. But then Sandy entered middle school and fell in with the wrong crowd. She started skipping class and staying out late without permission. Soon, Sandy was smoking pot and drinking and getting in trouble with the police. Her behavior escalated, and within a few months, she was suspended from school. Tim and Beth sent Sandy to rehab, but she immediately ran away and was subsequently sent to a juvenile center. When she was released, Tim and Beth decided it was best if they moved and let Sandy get a fresh start somewhere new. Sandy was enrolled in Flat Rock Middle School, where she met Holly Harvey. Holly and Sandy were instantly drawn to each other. Sandy introduced Holly to her friends, who, according to Maxim, also felt like outcasts at the middle school. The group of girls loved going to the movies and graffitiing buildings. When it was just the two of them, Holly and Sandy listened to music, smoked weed, and had sleepovers, usually at Sandy's, since Holly was living with her friend's family. Tim later told Maxim that he was impressed by Holly at first, who he said, quote, I thought she was possibly the nicest kid I ever met. As they grew closer, Sandy confided in Holly that she had dated both girls and boys before. 
but if she was being honest, she preferred girls. Sandy also told Holly that she was so pretty. Holly later recalled, I was falling in love with her, but I didn't understand it. I'd never felt this way about anyone before, and certainly not about a girl. In late April 2002, Holly went to Sandy's to stay the night. As they sat on the bed listening to music, Sandy asked Holly if she wanted to date her. Holly replied, you're just saying that to mess with me. Sandy told Holly, no, I really do like you. Then the two girls kissed, and everything just clicked for them. It wasn't long before everyone around town was talking about Holly and Sandy's scandalous lesbian relationship. Remember, they were living in an extremely conservative area. Every time the girls walked the aisle of the school bus, their classmates yelled homophobic slurs. It soon became unbearable for Sandy, who stopped riding the bus. This is where things seemed to have taken a turn for the girls. While they had both been troubled teens, Holly and Sandy's behavior escalated to a whole new level. It's as if they were feeding off of each other's trauma and angst. They started skipping school even more, usually hanging out in the woods. Holly told Maxim, We'd get high, lie around, and laugh at each other. We'd laugh all day. Holly and Sandy spent all of their time together. Cell phones weren't as ubiquitous at the time, so if the girls were apart, they wrote letters, many of them about their love for each other and their plans for the future. Holly wrote to Sandy, I'm glad I found you. God sent you to me. I don't care what it says about gay people in the Bible. Another time she wrote, You give me that feeling when I'm with you. It's like paradise. I figured out the word for it. It's called ecstasy, not the kind you buy. Look it up. Another word, utopia. Look that up, too. Sandy wrote, I hate it when older people say that young people don't know what love is. But I know what love is and how it feels, because age ain't nothing but a number. Sandy wrote that they should get married and have children. Holly responded, I don't have much to give, but you can have it. You can have me. Later, Holly's defense attorney, Judy Chister, said Sandy was the only person Holly thought she had a true relationship with, someone who cared for her and who she cared for in return. According to Chidester, they were in it for each other. When Carla was released from prison, Holly moved back in with her mom and Scott. But then in the spring of 2004, Carla was arrested again, this time for trying to sell marijuana to an undercover cop. Scott said Holly was not welcome to stay in his house due to her behavior, so Holly went to live with her grandparents, Carl and Sarah Collier. By this time, the Colliers were still enjoying their retirement, although Carl was painting houses to help stay busy. At the plantation drive home, Holly stayed in the basement, which Maxim described as a self-contained home within a home with a bedroom, a living room with a fireplace, and glass patio doors leading out to the lawn. Knowing their granddaughter had been raised with no structure, the Colliers immediately put a few rules in place. For the most part, their rules were not out of the ordinary. Sarah and Carl asked that Holly stop using drugs, sneaking out at night, and listening to rap music so loudly. There was another rule, and it was the worst one of them all. Holly was forbidden from ever seeing or speaking to Sandy Ketchum again. The Colliers did believe that Sandy was a bad influence on Holly, but their main issue with Sandy was that she was in a lesbian relationship with their granddaughter. The Colliers were conservative Baptists, very conservative, and they disapproved of Holly's relationship. So Sandy was banned from the Collier house and Holly was forbidden from speaking to or seeing Sandy. Neither girl had a driver's license, so it was nearly impossible for them to find ways to see each other in person. Again, without cell phones, the girls sent each other letters, writing things like, Man, I fucking miss you. I can't stand this crap no more. I really need to see you. Eventually, they decided to risk it all, and Sandy started sneaking into Holly's basement bedroom after the Colliers went to bed at around 10 p.m., or sometimes Holly would sneak out, making sure to be back home before her grandparents woke up at 6 a.m. 
The sneaking around started taking a toll on the girls. They were always worrying about getting caught. Holly felt trapped and began cutting herself, later saying she became addicted to the pain. She smoked 15 to 20 joints a day, but soon she and Sandy started using meth and if they could afford it, cocaine. As much as they thought they were sneaking around, Holly's grandparents were not fooled and Sarah called Beth, Sandy's stepmother, to inform her that the girls were in a lesbian relationship. Completely unaware of this, Beth asked Sarah how she knew. She said Holly had told her that she was in love with Sandy. Beth was shocked by what Sarah told her, but the more she thought about it, the more she realized it had been right in front of her the whole time. Beth confronted Sandy, who then lied and said she was bisexual. Thinking her daughter was going through hormonal changes, Beth told Sandy she was too young to know her sexuality. But Sandy insisted she did know. In fact, Sandy had known since she was a young girl, but due to the conservative nature of the area, she always felt extremely conflicted. One of her friends, Sarah Polk, later said Sandy often talked to her about her feelings. Beth told Sandy that she still loved her, but she was no longer allowed to see Holly. Sandy was devastated. Upset that her parents were putting these kind of rules in place, Sandy asked if she could talk to her birth mom, Sandra. Beth and Tim were reluctant. They knew how awful Sandra was, but they were also hopeful that starting a relationship with her mom might be good for Sandy. They reasoned that it might help her move on from Holly. Tim and Beth told Sandy that she could talk to her mom and they put the two in touch. The next day, Sandy told Tim and Beth that she wanted a relationship with Sandra. And in order to form it, she needed to move in with her. Now Tim and Beth were beyond reluctant. They knew that at this point, Sandra had six children, none of whom she had custody of. And she was living with a sketchy man in a dilapidated house. It wasn't a good place for Sandy to go. So Tim and Beth tried to talk her out of moving. But she was relentless. She wanted to move in with her mom. Tim and Beth eventually let her but only if there were a few specific rules in place, including that Sandy had to meet with her probation officer and that she could not see Holly Harvey. But just like Sandy was hoping, Sandra did not care what her daughter did, and in fact, she made it easy for Sandy and Holly to see each other. In mid-June, Holly ran away to stay with Sandy for four days. When she returned home to the Colliers, Holly was in major trouble. But she continued to break the rules and saw Sandy whenever she could. On June 29, 2004, Holly wrote to Sandy, quote, I'm so fucking tired of always having to walk away or drive away. It's like my world falls apart. You mean everything to me. You are my whole world. The only thing that matters to me is you. You are all I care about, and I can't wait for the day when we are together and we'll never have to leave each other again. That is, if we even have a future. Holly wasn't the only one frustrated in the Collier house. Carl and Sarah were at the end of their rope. To them, Holly was Carla 2.0, and they had no idea what to do. Things were so bad that Sarah would stop by her friend Bailey's house to cry about how Holly just didn't want to follow the rules. Sarah said she just couldn't put up with it anymore. Everywhere they went, the Colliers carried a quiet sadness. Back in the day, they had asked parishioners to pray for their daughter. Now they were asking for prayers for Holly. The pastor of the Colliers Church told the Atlanta Constitution, it's been heartbreak after heartbreak. They were desperate to put structure into the girl's life. Instead of accepting the structure, Holly got angry and spiraled even more out of control, saying things like, you better let me do what I want or I'll call the cops and tell them you hit me. Kevin F. McMurray wrote in his book that Holly's reaction was actually typical for somebody with her background. He got his information from Dr. Kathleen M. Hyde, an expert on young killers. Dr. Hyde says raising a child with no discipline, structure, or boundaries is a form of child abuse. And if the child makes it all the way to adolescence without any structure or discipline, 
then the consequences can be dire when somebody finally does step in to help. The child or teenager often looks at the authority figure as someone who wants to take away their freedom. Dr. Hyde says the child has the level of personality development of a much younger child, and because they've never been held accountable for their behavior, if someone tries to make them, they may feel angry and start spiraling out of control. An authority figure's first instinct is often to punish that kind of behavior, and that's exactly what the colliers tried to do. The worse Holly's behavior got, the more they brought the hammer down. According to Dr. Hyde, this is usually not the best solution and is actually the type of scenario that can end in murder, although it is rare. Dr. Hyde says there's no real way to predict when a murder will be the end result, but the best predictor is a minor incident of violence or the threat of violence. If either occurs, the teenager needs immediate clinical intervention. It is extremely unlikely that Sarah and Carl Collier knew any of that information, and even if they had, it's even more unlikely that they would have heeded Dr. Hyde's warnings. The Colliers were very religious, so religious that they forced Holly to stop taking her antidepressants because they felt prayer was the only cure. She begged and pleaded with her grandparents, telling them she needed the medication, but they would not give in. They felt they knew what was best for Holly. According to Holly, this wasn't the only abuse she faced at the hands of her grandparents. She told Maxim that Carl hit her, and Sarah would do things like call Holly a slut and tell her that she was going to turn out just like her mother. It is possible Holly thought up those allegations to make her situation seem worse than it was. After all, pretty much everyone else described the Colliers as being the nicest people in the world, the type to help with whatever you need not exactly the type you would expect to call their granddaughter a slut. But we also never know what goes on behind closed doors, and it is possible that the religious colliers were very much spare-the-rod-spoil-the-child kind of people. So it's also possible Holly was telling the truth. Sandy later told police that Holly and her grandparents were always fighting, and Carla said she was aware of her mother's temper. And the Collier's son, Kevin, told author Kevin McMurray that he witnessed his parents have knocked down drag out fights with Carla when she was a teen. By the time mid July rolled around, tensions in the Collier house were at an all time high. Holly and Sarah were at each other's throats, and Carl was growing more and more scared of Holly. Their son, Kevin, told the Atlanta Constitution they were concerned. They weren't sure what she was capable of. On the weekend of July 24th, Holly and Sandy bought weed, meth, and cigarettes, then packed up some food and cash. When nighttime came, the girls ran away. Four days later, Holly and Sandy were out of money, so they went back home. The colliers took Holly to the police station and asked them to charge her as a runaway. In the last week of July, the Colliers brought Holly to juvenile court to face her charges, where she was sentenced to three months of probation. As soon as the hearing was over and the family walked outside, Holly lit up a cigarette. Before getting in Carl's truck, she put her cigarette out on the hood, looked at her grandparents, and said, I'm going to kill you. Carl was livid and wanted to take Holly back inside to see the judge, but Sarah said no. She's been through enough today. When Carl told his son Kevin about Holly's threats, Kevin said to call 911 if they saw anything suspicious. And he later told author Kevin McMurray that he knew his parents wouldn't call the police because they feared Holly would, quote, pull some of Carla's old tricks, such as banging her head against the wall or causing some other self injury, and blame it on her grandparents. Kevin really did play off Holly's death threats figuring his niece was just being, quote, a disrespectful smartass. Plus, she was a small 15-year-old girl. What's the worst she could do? At dinner, on August 1st, the Colliers told Kevin that things were still going poorly. Holly had asked if she could take Carl's truck to the beach. They told her no, for plenty of reasons, but mostly because she didn't even have a driver's license. Holly became enraged at their refusal. She was spiraling, hard. 
Kevin wasn't surprised to hear that Holly was trying to escape the Collier home. He was very aware of how unhappy Holly was. She had told him multiple times. Kevin knew that when Holly was with her mom, she could do whatever she wanted, drink, smoke weed, and hang out with whoever she wanted, namely Sandy. But at her grandparents, none of these things were allowed. Kevin said that Holly was a caged animal. No one could predict what Holly would do to be freed from her cage. On August 2nd at 6.14 p.m., a woman called 911 to report that she had arrived home to find her daughter, Sarah Polk, in a panic. When she finally got Sarah calmed down enough to speak, Sarah said her friends, Holly and Sandy, had left after a very short visit. They had come by in hopes of taking a shower and changing their clothes. Sarah said that when the girls arrived, they were in a truck. Holly appeared to be full of adrenaline, while Sandy's face was ghost white. They were both covered in blood, head to toe. Sarah asked Sandy outright, what did you do? Before she could answer, Holly blurted out that they had killed her grandparents. Sarah could tell by the look on Sandy's face that Holly was not lying. Sarah told her friends that they could not shower there. However, she did grab them a damp towel. Holly and Sandy changed in the driveway and wiped up with a towel. Holly later told Maxim that when she changed, she realized the blood on her shirt and jeans had soaked through to her underwear. She even had blood on her socks and the inside of her shoes. As soon as they cleaned up, Holly and Sandy told Sarah to watch the news that night. Not long after the girls took off in the truck, Sarah's mom arrived home and they called the police. Sarah had no idea who Holly's grandparents were or where they lived, so officers asked her to call Holly's cell phone, which was really Carl's phone, and get her to give them a name. Sarah called and told Holly that she was wondering what her grandparents' names were because she hadn't seen anything on the news. It worked. Holly said, Sarah and Carl Collier and then hung up. Within 10 minutes of the 911 call, officers arrived at the Collier house, where they soon found a massacre. The Fayette County Sheriff told the Atlanta Constitution, I've never seen a crime this serious or this gruesome in 28 years of service. 74-year-old Carl was lying on his stomach on the kitchen floor, a pool of blood around him. An autopsy would show defensive wounds, eight stab wounds to the face, head, and neck, and nine to the chest and back area. The final and fatal cut severed Carl's aorta. 73-year-old Sarah was face up at the foot of the basement stairs. She had been stabbed in the head, neck, chest, abdomen, and upper arms 24 times. It was beyond overkill. Many of the wounds were deep and gaping. There was a large wound to Sarah's heart area where the killer had dug the knife in repeatedly. We know how much the Collier suffered, how horrific their wounds were, but we can't know for sure what happened in that house because Holly and Sandy told different stories. Let's start with what Holly later testified to, and then we'll get to Sandy's story. At around 11 p.m. on August 1st, Sandy snuck into the Collier's basement. After hanging out and smoking weed for a few hours, Holly got a call from Calvin Lawson, a 40-year-old drug dealer she knew through her mom. Lawson wanted to know if Holly was available to hang out, and she said sure. So he drove over and picked the two girls up, and they all went back to Lawson's apartment. The girls wanted some weed, but they didn't have any money, so Holly offered to pay Lawson with sex. He agreed to the trade then secretly laced a joint with crack cocaine to pump her up, as he put it. Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Jordan, a detective with the Fayette County Sheriff's Department, told Killer Instinct that Holly manipulated Lawson with her sexuality to get drugs. I guess that's another way of saying a 40-year-old man drugged and raped a 15-year-old girl. Even if it was Holly's idea, the age of consent in Georgia is 16, and Lawson drugged her. Afterwards, all three smoked the laced joint. 
soon it was almost 6 a.m., and Holly told Lawson they needed to get back home before her grandparents woke up. Lawson told the girls they were too messed up and needed to stay there. Holly begged him to take them home, which he did around 5.30. Holly and Sandy snuck back into the basement and spent the next few hours listening to music, occasionally sneaking outside to smoke cigarettes. By the time the afternoon arrived, they were feeling edgy and paranoid from the laced joint, so Sandy suggested that they go get something to calm down. They only had enough weed for one more joint, and that wasn't going to cut it. Holly called one of her friends to see if she could come pick her and Sandy up because they, quote, needed to get away, but the friend was not available. Sandy said they should steal the Collier's truck instead. Holly told her, we'll have to kill them to do that. Holly later testified that she didn't mean nothing by that comment. Sandy suggested that they hit the grandparents in the head with a lamp, but Holly said, quote, that might just make them pass out, then they will wake up. Sandy called her friend Samantha to see if she knew where to get a gun. When asked why she wanted one, Sandy said she wanted to take care of business. Samantha sarcastically asked her boyfriend Mark if he knew where to get a gun. He took the phone from Samantha and asked why she needed a gun so badly. He said Sandy just kept asking where she could get a gun, like six or seven times. Mark kept asking why she needed the gun, but Sandy would not give him an answer, so he gave the phone back to Samantha. Sandy told Samantha that she was scared that she was going to go to jail for murder. Samantha told her not to do anything stupid, but Sandy said goodbye and hung up. Sandy then suggested to Holly that they use a knife to kill the Colliers. Holly liked that idea, so she went to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife she could find. It was a seven-inch carving knife. According to Holly, Sandy stabbed Holly's mattress repeatedly to see if the knife was sharp enough to kill someone. Then, Sandy took a framed painting of puppies off the wall, laid it on the bed, and stabbed it. When they decided the knife was sharp enough, Holly wrote a to-do list on her arm. Keys, kill, money, jewelry. Then Holly and Sandy smoked the last of their weed so that the odor would lure the grandparents downstairs to the bedroom to investigate. When they heard the colliers walking downstairs, Sandy hid under the bed and Holly slipped the carving knife in the back of her waistband. Carl and Sarah knocked on Holly's door. Instead of confronting her about the marijuana odor, Carl told Holly he needed to look through the closet for a suitcase. Sarah was going to Hawaii soon and was hoping to get a start on packing. While Carl looked through the closet, Sarah stood at arm's length away from Holly. That's when Holly brought out the knife. As Sarah turned, Holly said she closed her eyes and stabbed her three times in the back. Sarah let out a scream, and Carl turned around to see what was going on. Holly opened her eyes, pulled out the knife, and saw Carl lunging at her. He punched Holly in the chin, and she said she went numb. The next thing she knew, both grandparents were pinning her to the bed. Holly started stabbing Carl in the chest while yelling at Sandy to help her. Sandy came out, and supposedly both colliers started cussing at her. Carl ran out of the bedroom towards the stairs. Sandy told Holly to give her the knife and go after him. Holly kept standing there, and Sandy yelled, Go get him! And Holly didn't move. Sandy told her, He's going to call 911. Holly finally gave Sandy the knife and ran upstairs. When she made it to the kitchen, she saw Carl with the phone in his hand. She ran toward him and pulled the cord out of the wall. Carl grabbed a fillet knife, which Holly wrestled out of his hand. Just then, Sandy came up from the basement. Carl threw a coffee cup at them, but missed, and the cup hit the wall behind Sandy's head. Holly said she closed her eyes and started stabbing Carl real fast as he fought back. The last stab hit Carl's aorta. Holly later testified that all of a sudden it felt like, quote, somebody just poured a big old bucket of hot water on me, so I had let go, and I opened my eyes, and he staggered and he walked around the kitchen island and he fell on the kitchen floor. 
The girls went downstairs, where they found Sarah lying face up at the bottom of the stairs. Holly said Sandy had stabbed Sarah in the chest, neck, back of the head, and arms. Sarah fought back, making her way across the basement to get to the stairs before she fell to the ground. But Sarah was still alive, so according to Holly, Sandy told her, You've got to finish her. Holly said she couldn't, but Sandy said, You've gotta. So Holly delivered the final stab. With the colliers now dead, Sandy and Holly packed a change of clothes and stole some of Sarah's jewelry. Not wanting to leave evidence behind, they grabbed the murder weapons, then ran outside and took off in Carl's blue Chevy truck. The two girls had no plan. They tried to figure out what they should do next. They figured they needed to go somewhere to shower and change, so they called their friend, Sarah Polk. While officers searched the Collier house for evidence, they found a poem Holly wrote. It described how depressed she had been and how she cried herself to sleep. One line read, All I want to do is kill. On Holly's vanity mirror, officers found pictures of Holly at the beach, where she had vacationed over the years. They suddenly had a feeling the girls were going to the beach in Carl's truck. And they were right. After leaving Sarah Polk's house, Holly and Sandy drove east on the highway, with no destination in mind. They talked about how much they loved each other, and how they were together now, forever. They also called other friends and told them about killing Holly's grandparents. Those friends also called the police. Holly and Sandy drove for more than four hours before they ran out of road on Tybee Island, located on the Georgia coastline. Right when the girls reached the beach, they drove past two guys, 14-year-old Brett and his 22-year-old brother Brian. The girls asked Brian if he had a cigarette, and then asked where the brothers were headed. Brian told them they were going to the beach, and the girls asked if they could tag along. He said sure. So the girls parked the truck at a nearby nursing home, then the group walked to the beach. Brett later told the Atlanta Constitution that the girls acted weird, quote, like you'd ask them a question and they kind of looked down and they wouldn't answer, and they always whispered to each other. During the walk, Sandy and Holly asked the brothers if they knew where they could sell some jewelry, an expensive-looking tennis bracelet, a gold necklace, a gold nugget charm, and two or three other gold bracelets or necklaces. The guys said no. They had actually just moved to the town that day and didn't know anything about the area. The girls told the guys that they didn't have any money and asked if they could stay at their place for the night. The brothers thought it was weird, but said okay. They asked if Holly and Sandy wanted to bring their truck over, but the girls said no. When Brian and Brett told their mom, Trish, about the girls staying the night, at first she told them no. But then she gave in because she figured they were just runaways. She didn't mind helping them for just one night. At some point, the girls admitted to Brian and Brett that they stole the truck they were driving. They asked him to help get rid of it, but he said no. They also told the brothers about how they stole the jewelry from Holly's grandparents, but they never said anything about the murders. Sandra and Holly went to bed cuddling. At the same time, the U.S. Marshal's Fugitive Task Force was called in to find the teenagers. They tracked Carl's cell phone, which Holly had also taken, and found that the signal disappeared at 1 a.m. The last location was in Tybee Island. Fayette County deputies and the U.S. Marshals drove to the Georgia coast to search for the girls. At 9 a.m., they located Carl's stolen truck parked at the nursing home. Inside the truck, authorities found a bag with bloody clothes and the two knives used to murder the colliers. Meanwhile, at the house with the brothers, Trish asked to use Holly's phone. She needed to call and set up the landline at their new house. Thinking nothing of it, Holly said sure, turned the phone on, and Trish made the call. U.S. Marshals were still tracking Holly's phone, and now were able to narrow their search down to two homes. More than 25 highly armed officers busted into one of the houses, but it was the wrong one so they quickly ran over to the other one. At around 2 p.m., they finally busted in and arrested Holly and Sandy. According to Killer Instinct, when officers reached the girls, 
they found that each one had a kitchen knife in their pocket. Holly and Sandy had stolen them from Trish. Authorities would later theorize the girls had planned to rob and murder Trish and her two sons. Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Jordan of the Fayette County Sheriff's Department told the Associated Press that Holly laughed at the 25 arresting officers. He said, quote, She was callous and cocky. She is the coldest and most heartless individual I've ever interviewed. It almost made her giddy to know we brought so many people to arrest her. When she was done laughing, Jordan noticed Holly was trying to wiggle out of her handcuffs. He put a knee in her back, dropped all his weight onto her, and said, You're not fighting with your grandmama now. That's when he noticed the handwritten to-do list on Holly's arm that read, Kill, Keys, Money, Jewelry. The teen fugitives were taken to the local police station, where Sandy cooperated fully, giving a full confession to Detective Jordan. It is unclear what Sandy told him. However, according to author Kevin F. McMurray, this is what Sandy later told her parents and a psychiatrist. On the night of August 1st, Sandy snuck into Holly's bedroom like she had done so many times before. The girls did go to the drug dealer's house, smoking the lace joint, and then went back to Holly's. That afternoon, Sandy packed up her stuff to leave because she was tired of sneaking around all the time. She was scared she'd get in trouble with her probation officer, and the fighting between Holly and her grandparents was too much to handle. Holly begged Sandy not to leave, so she agreed to stay. But Sandy still felt the overwhelming need to get out of the Collier house, so she told Holly they should steal Carl's truck and leave. Holly replied, I just want to kill them. Sandy laughed, because she didn't think Holly was serious. She claimed she didn't know it was a joke until the killing started. Holly grabbed a knife, and Sandy hid under the bed, and then Holly lured her grandmother into the basement. When they started arguing, and Carl came down, both grandparents pinned Holly down onto the bed. Holly started yelling at Sandy for help. But Sandy was scared, so she didn't move. Holly kept calling out, so Sandy finally left her hiding place. That's when she said she saw Holly stab Sarah Collier. Sandy said she got into a wrestling match with them and tried to take the knife away from Holly. Sandy said she screamed for everyone to stop, but they just looked at her like she didn't exist. Holly, still pinned to the bed under Sarah, started screaming that she couldn't breathe and yelled to Sandy to get Sarah off of her. Sandy then admitted to stabbing Sarah in the arm in the back of her head, but said she didn't kill her. Holly then chased Carl upstairs, and Sandy said she heard, quote, all the hollering and screaming, so she went up to see what was going on. When she walked into the kitchen, Carl threw a coffee cup at her. She ducked, and it hit the wall. When Sandy looked back towards the struggle, she saw Holly stab Carl, quote, one more time in the neck, and he fell to the floor dead. Sandy and Holly went back downstairs and found Sarah lying at the foot of the stairs. Sandy told Holly that her grandma was still breathing. She said they should leave her alone and run. But Holly wanted to finish Sarah off, so she tried to stab her in the stomach, but was struggling. Holly told her, this bitch is too fat, it won't go in. So Holly stabbed her grandmother in the chest, hitting her heart. The girls grabbed a change of clothes, jewelry, and cash, and then fled. They went to Sarah Polk's house, like Holly said, and after they left, they headed for the Georgia coast. Sandy said on the drive, Holly was kicked back in the seat like nothing had happened, and Sandy kept saying they were going to prison for the rest of their lives. Holly tried to convince her that no, they weren't. Back at the Tybee Island police station, Holly's interview with Detective Jordan could not have gone more differently than Sandy's. When she was brought into the interrogation room, Jordan yelled at the officer escorting her, Don't sit her down. He looked directly at Holly and asked, Are you going to talk to me? Holly replied, No. And Jordan told her, Good, you little bitch. I don't want to talk to you either, but I'm going to send you down the river. And with that, the interview was over. I mean, I thought the point was to try and get a confession, but whatever, Detective Jordan. He had Sandy. I guess he didn't feel the need to get Holly's side of the story. 
Following his supposed interviews with both teen suspects, Jordan told the media that Holly was showing no remorse while Sandy was distraught over what had happened. Jordan said he was convinced Holly was a stone-cold manipulator who persuaded Sandy into getting involved. He said Sandy only joined in the attack because she loved Holly. Jordan believed that if Holly had not called out for Sandy's help, she probably never would have come out from under the bed. Now remember, Detective Jordan was telling the media all of these details not long after the girls had been arrested. His actions had already been questionable, probably squeaking right above the line, but talking to the press like that is typically forbidden. He was tainting the jury pool before Holly and Sandy were even indicted. Sandy Ketchum and Holly Harvey were transported back to Fayette County and indicted on two counts of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, and one count of armed robbery. They were to be tried as adults, although due to their age, the death penalty was off the table. During the transport, Sandy could not stop crying about how she couldn't get rid of the smell of blood. Every five minutes, she was smelling blood. She also said, those people didn't deserve to die. On the other hand, Holly was completely silent, never muttering a single word. This behavior only helped fuel Detective Jordan's allegations that Holly was a cold-blooded killer without an ounce of remorse. Holly's court-appointed defense attorney, Judy Chidester, later rightly pointed out to author Kevin F. McMurray that people have different responses to shock and trauma. Just because Holly was being quiet and wasn't sobbing and confessing her feelings, did not mean that she wasn't remorseful. Chidester said that 15-year-old Holly was in shock and couldn't remember much of anything, just a lot of screaming, although she wasn't sure from who. When Chidester told her what happened, Holly replied, I can't believe they are dead. I can't believe I did that. I feel like it's a bad dream. Carl and Sarah Collier's funeral was held on August 9th with more than 900 people in attendance. Their daughter and Holly's mother, Carla, was unable to attend the funeral since she was in prison, though her family did try to get her there. Instead, Carla released a statement. My family has suffered a great loss. I've lost three people whom I love. During the funeral service, the pastor advised the mourners to focus on the lives of the colliers, not their deaths. Remember them for their love of Christ and the sacrifices they made, he said. Another reverend officiating told mourners that the colliers sacrificed their lives trying to help Holly. He said, quote, I believe that even on that night, as blood streamed out of their bodies, that they called out to God, forgive them. They know not what they do. One day they will. The collier's son, Kevin, did not speak at the funeral. Instead, he played the trombone in the orchestra and wrote a message in the program, which read in part, quote, no one could have ever guessed my loving parents would have gone to the Lord in this senseless way. I long to see them again and have asked all the hard questions, but I know those answers are in God's hands. Holly's attorney, Judy Chidester, told the Atlanta Constitution that when Holly was informed of her grandparents' funeral, she was very distraught and broke down sobbing. Holly asked her lawyer if the whole world hated her. I'm sure Chidester tried to be kind to her young client, but Holly's instincts were right. On August 12th, Sandy and Holly both sobbed through their joint bond hearing. Sandy's parents, Tim and Beth Ketchum, spoke on behalf of their daughter, saying they would care for her if she was released on bond. No one testified for Holly, which she seemed surprised by. She asked her attorney, Is there anybody who's going to testify for me? Chidester later said Holly was distraught because she was alone. Obviously, it was really hard for the Collier's loved ones to come to terms with how their own granddaughter killed them, the granddaughter they had been trying so hard to help. Sarah Collier's friend Bailey told the Atlanta Constitution that she gets really upset when she thinks about Sarah's last moment. Quote, she was looking at someone in the last minutes of her life who she loved and tried to save, and now she's the one turning on you. On April 14, 2005, Holly and Sandy both took plea deals. 
Sandy pled guilty to two counts of malice murder and one count of armed robbery and was sentenced to three life terms to be served concurrently. She could apply for parole in 14 years. The prosecution said they recommended a more lenient sentence for Sandy because she cooperated with authorities. And because she had already confessed to Detective Jordan, she did not have to repeat her story for the record. Holly pled guilty to two counts of malice murder and all the other charges were dropped. As part of her plea, Holly did have to testify to what happened on August 2, 2004. When she was done telling the events of that fateful day, Judge Pascal English asked Holly if she had wanted to kill her grandparents. She said yes, and the judge followed up with a question of why. It didn't seem like they'd ever done anything besides try to raise her. Holly was apprehensive to answer, but she finally said, quote, Only the family knows. My grandmother used to scream at me and tell me all kinds of things. She used to tell me that the only reason I lived there was because so I didn't go to the Department of Family and Children's Services. And when I was like 10, she used to call me a slut. And my grandfather, he hit me. Judge English asked if that's why she killed them, and Holly replied no. She did it, quote, for Sandy, so that we could be together. We could leave. Later, after Holly was sentenced, she told her attorney, Judy Chidester, that she didn't understand why she killed her grandparents. All she knew was that after she stabbed her grandma the first time, she couldn't stop. A force had taken hold of her. Judge English asked Holly if she thought 20 years in prison was a good deal for murdering her grandparents. Holly said no and Judge English asked what she thought should happen to her. Holly replied, I think I should be dead. The judge responded, We both agree on that, but the posture of the law is that a juvenile cannot be sentenced to death. Before he handed down Holly's sentence, Judge English told her that in his 30 years serving the justice system, 18 of which were as a judge, he had seen, quote, some hardened criminals come through the court. And yet, a 15-year-old little girl comes in in front of me and admits to savagely killing the people she lives with. And I can tell you this, I can't think of another case in the 30 years that has been as nonsensical or as brutal as this. He told Holly that if she was older, the prosecution would have sought a harsher sentence. He added, You are fortunate that you were just a little too young for the full force of the law to be invoked. I say you're lucky. Judge English sentenced Holly to two consecutive life sentences. She could apply for parole in 20 years. According to author Kevin F. McMurray, following the hearing, Detective Bruce Jordan told the media that some things Holly testified to were, quote, inconsistent with the evidence. He said Holly was the more dominant one in the relationship and that Sandy was not an equal player in the murders as Holly was making it out to seem. The thing is, Holly had to testify truthfully or else she would lose her plea deal. Her attorney, Judy Chidester, has admitted that Holly probably minimized her role. However, there was no evidence to prove Holly was the ringleader and that Sandy was simply following Holly's every direction. Chidester said Detective Jordan was just giving his opinion, which we know he just loved to do. But in the end, it didn't matter legally. Both girls participated in the murders. After Sandy and Holly were sentenced, authorities arrested 41-year-old Calvin Lawson, the dealer that laced the girls' weed with crack cocaine. As it turns out, Holly's testimony was the first time any member of law enforcement heard the two girls had been drugged prior to the murders. That's why Lawson had not been arrested already. It should be noted that Holly did not come up with the Calvin Lawson story on the stand. She had told her attorney about it, as well as the psychiatrist who evaluated her after her arrest. Sandy had also told her attorney and psychiatrist about Lawson. I do question why their attorneys did not explore this as a mitigating circumstance, especially since Lawson legally raped Holly Harvey. In a weird twist, it was actually Holly's mom, Carla, who led authorities to Lawson. During Holly's testimony, Judge English tried to get more information about Lawson. Holly told him that she only knew Calvin's first name. Judge English asked how she knew him, and Holly tried to wiggle out of answering, 
but the judge made her. Holly had to admit that she knew Calvin through her mom, who had introduced her months before. Carla was actually out of prison at the time of the hearing. She was sitting in the courtroom while Holly testified. Following the hearing, officers grilled Carla about Calvin and found out his last name. Carla didn't want to give it up, but she knew if she didn't, they would send her back to prison. Damn. Talk about a shitty mother. She wanted to protect the drug dealer who raped her daughter. Disgusting. Calvin Lawson was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor and furnishing harmful materials to a minor. And because in Georgia, committing a felony that leads to a murder is grounds for a murder charge, Lawson was also charged with murder. He was not, however, charged with the rape of Holly Harvey. By October, all of the charges against him were dropped due to a lack of evidence. It wasn't that there was no evidence against Lawson. There just wasn't enough for a conviction. Following their convictions, many people were curious if Holly and Sandy were going to start talking to each other again. They had been forbidden to communicate before the plea bargains. In November 2005, Sandy told author Kevin F. McMurray that they still wrote each other letters, but she had to let Holly go romantically because, quote, she's just not right in the head. Sandy said, I will always love Holly, but I don't feel for her anymore. As the months passed and Holly and Sandy settled into their new normal, their correspondence slowed. In 2007, the Atlanta Constitution published a Where Are They Now article about the teen killers. Sandy's attorney told the AC that he believed Sandy had, quote, settled into what I'd call a doing time kind of attitude. I think she's adjusting to the notion that she's going to spend 14 years in prison. Sandy had earned her GED which made her parents really proud. Holly's attorney said, she's doing pretty well. Because of her young age when she went to prison, there were adult women who watched out for her and protected her from unpleasant people that you can find in prison. Holly had also earned her GED. It doesn't appear that Sandy ever appealed her conviction or sentences, but Holly did. However, she didn't file for an appeal until June 2012 which was incredibly late. She filed numerous amendments, but the appeal never went anywhere. Today, Sandy is incarcerated in the Pulaski State Prison in Hawkinsville. She was first eligible for parole in 2019, but was denied. Holly is incarcerated in the Arendelle State Prison in Alto and won't be eligible for parole until 2025. The Georgia Department of Corrections does not list an estimated release date for either woman, and the parole board lists their tentative parole month as life, so it doesn't look like either woman will be released anytime soon. Parole after 15 or 20 years for a double murder sounds like an incredibly light sentence. Holly is 34 and Sandy is 35. If they are never paroled, they have a long life in prison ahead of them. If they are, what future awaits them? I can understand why both defense attorneys counseled and then negotiated plea deals. Going to court for the savage and gruesome murder of an elderly couple, especially when Sandy immediately confessed, would have been beyond tough. Hell, the girls had to wear bulletproof vests at their arraignment. And while I am sickened by the brutality of their crime, My heart also aches a little bit thinking of their young age. While Sandy's upbringing was not nearly as bleak as Holly's, she was still suffering with homophobia and addiction issues. As for Holly, I wonder if she ever had a chance. She was neglected, sexually abused, trafficked by her own mother. She was bounced from home to home, never really wanted. Until Sandy wanted her until Sandy loved her, and until she loved Sandy. And faced with losing Sandy, Holly felt like a caged animal. But her violent, impulsive bid for freedom destroyed all of their lives. And ironically, she now sits in an actual cage, waiting for freedom and redemption.
Southern Fraud True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was written and researched by Haley Gray and myself. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please visit my website, southernfraudtruecrime.com, and go to the Listener Suggestion tab. And if you have submitted a case suggestion in the last few months, please resubmit it on the website. This is the best way for me to get to those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please, do come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fraud, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern Lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. Until next time. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.